with item 29, Nevada Department of Wildlife update of guidelines for harvest management in Nevada. Game Division Administrator Brian Wakeling for possible action. The department will provide an update on the status and process of refining the draft harvest guidelines for consideration by the commission. The department will provide a briefing on feedback received at public meetings held on August 24th to the 26th and September 6th through the 7th in Ely, Elko, Winnemucca, Las Vegas, and Reno. The commission may provide the department with direction regarding further development. The department intends to provide the commission with a final briefing on the harvest guidelines at their meeting in November. Mr. Wakeling. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, Brian Wakeling, Game Division Administrator. Uh, I can't help but start this one out by saying thank you, may I have another. <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. <laughs> uh, and I think it was made really clear uh, throughout the conversation on the prior uh, uh, agenda item. There was no effort to try and be secretive or subversive in any way through any of these efforts. And I, I want to you know, extend my apologies, um, especially on this one. Following our last uh, uh, commission workshop, um, I specifically did uh, send copies of the, the document that we had to each of the, uh, the cabs. My assumption in so doing was they would have more time to consider that and do so with a longer lead time um, we did not post that um, on the website until just recently, uh, primarily because I did not want to confuse any revision with, with what we had worked on prior. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask forgiveness on that one. Recognize that the commission's probably uh, going to have some reservations about trying to take any action on this today. But I thought that there's probably some value. I actually have quite a few slides and I, I think probably the real benefit in going through those is going to be the opportunity to kind of give our, our new commissioners kind of an overview of where we've been, what we've done, and uh, at the Commission's pleasure afterwards uh, what, what you would choose to do. Um, essentially we're not looking for any action uh, really from the Commission today. We consider this to be our, our uh, uh, you know, first opportunity to um, share feedback that we've received to date. Uh, some of the revisions that we've made to the guidelines to date. Um, and then uh, we fully intend to bring this back to the commission in November. And at that point, uh, it, it's our hope that the, the commission may choose to act on it at that point in time. Um, if they choose not to, um, we'll certainly take the guidance that you provide us with at that time. Uh, January, we, we still have the ability to bring these back to you. Uh, but we will largely be formulating our seasons uh, in uh, in alignment with the guidance we're, we've gotten so far. So with that, um, I just want to do a real quick, um, well, hopefully relatively quick revision uh, review of the process. Uh, we initiated this. I first came to the commission in August of 2015 and, and shared the concept with them. Uh, this has been a team approach, and we've involved um, multiple divisions. Um, I think uh, we're up to four, a minimum of four divisions that we've involved in this. Um, I've got, uh, the next slide has got the uh, individuals that were involved in it, and then I've got some slides uh, just to, to remind everybody what the, the first presentation I made to the Commission on this topic. Uh, so the guidelines team, uh, this is the uh, folks on there. Um, these folks have, uh, they're species experts, they're field biologists, they're regional supervisors. Uh, we've involved uh, our uh, folks from uh, uh, conservation education. We've invo involved uh, our habitat division. Um, and most recently, we've, in we've in, uh, included our, uh, our law enforcement to help us uh, assess you know, what we're proposing. Does it make sense? Does this create uh, enforcement issues or does it make them better? So this is the, uh, the idea that I shared with the Commission in August of a year ago. I suggested that harvest guidelines are not new. We manage wildlife populations by objective. Um, those objectives can take any form. They can, they can deal with harvest. They can deal with um, pop, you know, characteristics of the population that we're managing. Um, 
we want to re-examine the objectives that we're looking, that we're currently managing for and consolidate them. And in the process of doing it, we want to look at the, what current science tells us and we want to look at our comparative data from other states around us. We want to seek input from our stakeholders and the public as we go through this. Um, and then I wanted to, to talk about some process and benefits. So <clears throat> we talked about where our management objectives currently reside. They currently exist within federal regulation, state statute, uh, commission rule. Um, we've got a variety of plans scattered across the landscape. Um, sometimes it's just when we show up at uh, season setting meetings, we'll get guidance at that point in time. Um, we've also got uh, documents that were developed uh, such as the Greater Sage-Grouse Comprehensive Conservation Strategy that helped guide us. <coughs> so we wanted to take the time to re-examine and consolidate. These, uh, the, the objectives are somewhat dated. Um, in some instances, uh, they can be difficult to locate. Um, should we be considering new things, new approaches? And uh, we discussed the concept of reinventing a wheel versus building a better mousetrap. We really don't want to reinvent the wheel. We've got a pretty good square one and it runs well. So then we also wanted to look at the, the lessons we've learned collectively. I, I talked about uh, reviewing the research, uh, better ways to do what we do. Um, is there something missing? And the ones we uh, specifically talked about were antlerless harvests. And so that's something that we've worked really diligently as we've gone through this to try to develop ways. Uh, comparative data, uh, we wanted to look at our neighboring states. We did, we benchmarked with them, looked at how they were doing things. Um, and, you know, interestingly, we mentioned license simplification, and I think that was something that uh, that we hadn't even initiated at the time I put that in the slide. Uh, but hunter demographics, what are we seeing in Nevada compared to other states? Um, but we also wanted to recognize each state has a unique set of conditions and publics, and just because another state does it doesn't mean that that's something Nevada needs to adopt. We also wanted to uh, look at our stakeholder and public opinion, see what the, they had to, uh, had to provide us. Um, recognizing that the commission is the uh, public trustees, the, the wildlife biologists are trust managers. Um, we want to seek out what the stakeholders and the public want. And a lot of people tend to lump people in groups. Um, for instance, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, well, hunters want this. Well, hunters, like any segment of the public, have multiple segments. They're not, they don't all want the same thing. And so we wanted to make sure we understood uh, what the uh, the hunters in in Nevada were requesting uh, talking about alternative management and things of that nature um, so the process I proposed was consolidating the existing objectives reviewing <clears throat> the, the scientific literature uh, going through the comparative data sharing the information with the public and seeking feedback um, sharing with the Commission back in November of last year and then review, revise, and update, and uh, ultimately providing a commission with guidelines for harvest and management in Nevada. You'll notice that there are three dots following Nevada. That's because this is about where the, the uh, wheels came off, and uh, we started to, to kind of, my initial timeline got uh, uh, subordinated to quite a few different priorities, uh, not the least of which was the license simplification. Benefits that we saw to this was that biologists uh, the trust managers would have clear direction. Uh, right now, uh, one of the public meetings we had, um, I had a conversation with an individual, um, and uh, and they were expressing some doubt with the uh, the process we were using, you know, trying to get these down in one place. And what he said is, you know, we just kind of like the flexibility we have now, and. That's, part, that's primarily the frustration that most of our biologists feel. When we're trying to formulate a recommendation, we need to know what we're shooting at. We need to know what our goals are. And so if they're not clearly articulated, we can, we can miss the mark. And a lot of people have a lot of different understandings of what that is. And so it's important for, um, 
for everybody to understand what our common goal is. It can't just be flexibility. We need to know what we're shooting for. Um, <clears throat> the commission, trustees of the public trust, um, this is another way to get public uh, feedback. Cabs play a very vital role and, and absolutely don't want to circumvent or, or make them less relevant. But the thing about a public meeting, a town hall meeting, a cab meeting, or even a commission meeting is we do not get a, propor a proportional response. We don't get the, to a sense of um, how many people feel a particular way or desire a particular um, topic. Cabs, you know, obviously want them involved in the review. We want them to understand what we're shooting for, and they still provide very important uh, input. And the public as well, um, they benefit from this. It simplifies and standardizes their lives to some degree. What this guideline won't do is eliminate differences of opinion. People will still disagree. People will still um, uh, disagree with where the commission chooses to send uh, the department. Uh, the department will still make recommendations that are not consistent with what everybody believes. Um, however, um, it should provide that avenue for honest dialogue. It'll, it'll foster that, in my opinion. Um, it also will not eliminate model challenges to the North American model. That model is not a static thing. It is something that continues to evolve. <coughs> so then we uh, we we. We sought public input. We did uh, um, some meetings in November of 2015, um, and we provided a briefing to the commission on that. Uh, we, based on that input from that survey, we also crafted a survey uh, and that we sent to people who buy uh, hunting licenses. Now, we have not limited all of our input to only licensed purchasers. But for this survey, we did because, again, we're looking for their ideas on how uh, our existing harvest guidelines work. We, we're not trying to exclude anyone from the process, but certain people have different perspectives on, uh, on, on different aspects of it. We don't want to exclude people from the process. So this is the update that we provided in November. Um, we talked it, uh, we gave the kind of the timeline of what we've been involved in, commission brief briefing in first in August 8th, uh, Bather Gathering, <clears throat> our first draft, uh, then in October, uh, we did a media release letting people know about it. Um, we had some media exposure. The second through the sixth of November, we had town hall meetings. Uh, we had uh, approximately 95 public and 70 agency personnel <coughs> that participated in those. Um, and then uh, um, ultimately, we uh, uh, took these this input to the commission. Uh, we had 13 pages of summarized comment. Um, 22 different public, three agency. Uh, we had, uh, you know, specific conversation at a particular cab, um, and uh, and so on. I mean, you can. Uh, we we went ahead and distributed it this back to everybody that attended the town hall meeting and, and chose to provide in uh, their email. So then the questionnaire. Um, we released the questionnaire in March of 2016. This was reviewed by a professional human dimensions company. In fact, it was uh, uh, Chase and Chase, uh, again, the same company that helped us with the license simplification. We mailed it to 2,200 randomly selected uh, hunting or combination license holder holders. We had about a 36% response rate, which gives us plus or minus 4% accuracy, which is pretty similar to a lot of political polling, a lot better than some. Um, so some of the results that we got off of that uh, survey, 57% <clears throat> of the people classified themselves as primarily or mostly a big game hunter. 32% both. And only 7% classified themselves as primarily or mostly an upland game hunter. 88% of the people uh, that responded had not, prior, had not had any prior knowledge to the harvest guidelines. 61% uh, reported not hearing of county advisory boards. Um, that's similar to the, uh, the response we had when, uh, in the 2014 mule deer uh, survey. 93% uh, of the people that responded had not attended a commission meeting within the last three years. 
Uh, about three-fourths of them had hunted in Nevada within the last three years, and a little over half had helped somebody else on a hunt in Nevada within the last three years. Hunter crowding was something that a lot of people brought up, and when we asked to them to think about their last hunt, 69% of the respondents said that crowding was not an issue on their last hunt. We then talked about season length to try to deal with uh, hunter crowding. If we had shorter seasons, we could have more seasons and put more people in the field for shorter periods of time with less crowding. 53% of the respondents didn't think that was a good idea. They either disagreed or strongly disagreed with it. We asked the uh, inverse, asked them if, uh, what if seasons should be as long as possible so the hunters should, could select when they go afield. 51% of the respondents thought that was a good idea. Um, so over half, and there's uh, a, a proportion of people that d expressed no opinion or, or chose not to respond to that question as well. Um, <clears throat> we asked the question, and this kind of also gets back to uh, you know issuing two doe tags to an individual. Um, people, hunters tend to be a little bit uh, concerned about getting giving someone a second tag. We asked, um, should antlerless hunters, uh, for specifically for elk, be allowed to have a second tag if our objective is to reduce elk tags or elk numbers in that area? 44% agreed, 44% disagreed. But when you start breaking that into a strong and and just agreement, more people agreed than disagreed, but more people strongly disagreed than strongly agreed. This this was not one that we could find any consensus on. We did ask if we were looking to eliminate an elk population or reduce it to the extent possible um, if that population is not wanted there. 73% of the people responded, agreed or strongly agreed, that offering tags over the counter in unlimited numbers was a good idea. Um, this is something that other states have tried and after it's been in place for a while it tends to work real, real well. Um, but when you first make that transition, it can be extremely painful. You get a lot of people uh, participating, trying to, until they figure out what a, that, you know, generally this isn't a particularly good hunt. We asked the question, uh, should Endow sh strive for consistency in opening closing dates for various species? For deer, 66% of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed that we should strive for consistency. For elk, only 50% of the people agreed or strongly disagreed, but 16% of the people expressed no interest or no opinion. So 34% of the people disagreed with the idea. So you still had a, a majority of people thought that consistency was a good idea. <coughs> so I mentioned that we, we kind of uh, hung up at this point. Uh, we didn't, uh, we delayed our implementation. Uh, we had uh, competing public demands, license simplification, so we kind of put this on hold until we got through a lot of the license simplification stuff. Um, ultimately brought this back at the August CAB workshop. And this is where we, we, we had produced another document. Um, we had uh, comparing um, our updated and our, our existing guideline documents and we requested input. Um, and so this is the information from that particular presentation. Uh, this is what we uh, we took out, um, look into streamline, simplify, standardize, increase value, um, and also increase the understanding of the rationale of what we're doing. Um, now this is one of the more frequent uh, uh, pieces of confusion that I, I hear uh, people argue opposite sides of. Um, department recommendations should be consistent with the best biological science. Honestly, I don't think the department has ever brought a recommendation to the commission that we didn't believe was in the best biological uh, science consistent with the other direction that we had, had been provided. When we provide one of these recommendations, a lot of times you'll hear people say, let science drive it. Um, and one of the arguments you often hear is with the bear hunt. Um, we should hunt bears because science says we can or um, bear hunting is bad. From a scientific standpoint, the, uh, the bear plan that was developed and the bear uh, recommendations that the department has brought forward 
is scientifically valid and biologically sustainable based on the data and the understanding that our biologists have. There are those who will differ with that and um, you may even find they, they could certainly produce biologists from other agencies or other places that will disagree with us. But we believe that it's scientifically defensible. However, we're also equally willing to acknowledge that if we chose not to hunt bears, we would not, that would not be a biologically bad thing to have happen. So both of those can be defended with science. Um, oftentimes you'll have the same people argue that we should be hunting bears because the best data, the best science says we should. We'll also argue against an antlerless harvest because they don't feel like that's the right thing. They don't feel like science supports that. We can, we feel and we believe that uh, the science also supports that aspect of it. We can harvest antlerless segment of the population and be biologically viable. So our biological sideboards are generally far broader than our social sideboards. The social sideboards, which is why we ask the public and why we ask the cabs for their input. Um, and that's what we're trying to define with these harvest guidelines. The, with the commission approval, these guidelines, and I keep, I keep reminding people that these guidelines are not commissional regulation, they're not commission general regulation, they're not statute, they are not binding. Essentially, this is the opportunity for the commission to provide us with direction on what they want to see us manage for. We're providing with you with the basis of the guidelines that we believe to be biologically uh, reasonable and defensible and at that point, if the commission chooses to adopt these, we will use these to guide our development of recommendations into the future. Um, the commission or the cab can choose to go outside of the guidelines. Um, our response, if you ask us why we didn't go there, will be because it's outside of guidelines. <coughs> we expect to have regular review of the guidelines, um, but that is kind of the social sideboards that any commission can choose to give us. And you can choose to amend that at any point in time. Any time that the department makes a recommendation and we are outside of guidelines, we'll provide you with the, with the we'll identify that it's outside of guidelines and we'll tell you why. Uh, for instance, um, the, uh, an example of that was the uh, antlerless harvest that we, we shared with you today. That was not something that we recommended during the regular session. It was for a specific reason, and we explained why. Now, throughout this document, we, and throughout this process, I keep saying we're not going to change objectives. And essentially, we have not. But in many instances, we may have changed how we measure those objectives. We're still trying to get to the same endpoint, but we may change it a little bit on what we're measuring. And so the examples, whoop, um, mule deer, our buck to doe ratio in most of our unit plans say we're going to manage 30 bucks per hundred does. We measure this in the fall, it's a post hunt estimate. Um, we've got data, we collect it during the appropriate time period. <clears throat> we're not recommending any change to that. We want to continue to manage for that, uh, uh, that area. Um, we may have some challenges with our existing survey, trying to get it done in all of the areas. That's a process challenge. It's not relevant to the guidelines. And we may initiate some changes to how we do what we do, just so we can better uh, measure our, our achievement on this. But that's a process challenge, and it's not really relevant to the guidelines. We're going to, this is what uh, we told everybody we would manage towards, and we're not proposing a change. Antlerless harvest, on the other hand, um, is something we do now, uh, but the rationale for it is more obscure, and we don't do a very good job of explaining why. Uh, Tom's presentation today, I think, did a, did a pretty good job, but we don't articulate that anywhere um, in a written format that we can manage towards. And so we want to define the population size and conditions under which the agency would make that kind of a recommendation. Probably a more extreme example is with elk. Currently we have bull to cow ratio objectives. And <clears throat> we measure it at the wrong time of the year if we're truly trying to get an accurate estimate of what's out there. We measure it in the winter time and there's reasons why we do that. And we're not proposing we change survey for elk. We still have to measure 
um, elk populations so that we could determine where we are in proximity to population objectives that are dictated in our elk plans. We still want to measure that, we still want to do that. But our models tell us that in most populations, you know, and what it says in the guidelines is we want to manage, manage for 30 to 40 bucks per hundred, or bulls per hundred cows. We can probably get there. Right now, we're probably in most areas closer to 70 to 80, and some areas as high as 90 or 100. Um, that's influenced by our attempt to manage those population objectives. My sense is that uh, the public likes where we're managing our bull elk populations, and we don't want to try to drive them down. Um, however, um, we can get at this through another way. Um, as with predators, oftentimes with prey populations, we can look at two different aspects of a population. We can look at the population characteristics, buck to doe ratio, population size, uh, recruitment rates, or we can look at harvest characteristics. And we do this a lot with um, uh, migratory waterfowl. We'll do it with um, a lot of different small game species. We look at the harvest characteristics, and that gives us an indication of uh, how, how exploitative we are on the, the other part of the population. And so what we're proposing is that we would look at bull elk main beam length, and we did. And what we've seen is that bull elk have a cur curvilinear relationship between main beam length and age. This is something we've developed throughout most of our units. We've got a great sample size on this. And what we find is that uh, elk tend to achieve maximum uh, elk main beam length somewhere between 6 to 10 years of age, 5 to 10 years of age. So what we want to do is measure the proportion of the harvest that we see in that area. And what we found, looking at our existing data, is that bull elk should comprise 25 to 35 percent, 50 inch or main, greater main beam length. We've got 98 percent of the people that harvest elk report this. This is um, a great data set. It's independent of what our bull ratio is, but it looks at the age structure of the population and what we can expect to harvest. If the elk population goes up, we can still manage this. If the population goes down, we can still manage to this. This will help us adjust those, uh, those elk permits. Um, if we look in units where we are aggressively addressing elk populations, for instance, 061071, we have seen the, this, uh, the proportion of those bigger bulls drop. That's consistent. If, if you lean on the population, that, as, that proportion of the population drops out first. That's what's selected for. On the other hand, there's a couple of units where we're more conservative. And in those areas, we see that, that proportion of uh, the harvest increase. <coughs> Other changes that uh, we're, we're discussing, <coughs> um, and again, this doesn't change what we're doing. It changes uh, how we measure it. With pronghorn, the buck to doe ratios currently say that we'll manage for 20 to 30 bucks per 100 does. In most of our units, we're well over that. However, if we look at the older age class bucks, those two years old and older, the ones that comprise most of the legal harvest, um, that fits in pretty well. And so um, we're not looking to um, measure this or the, or the bull elk uh, main beam length through aerial surveys. The main beam length is what's measured off the harvest. The uh, buck to doe ratio comes off of our model based on what we've seen for recruitment and existing buck to doe ratios. We still have to conduct the surveys. Um, <clears throat> we've not done a good job of specifying when we do our doe hunts. The bear hunt, um, our bear plan says we'll manage things one way. At the end of the, uh, um, the uh, bear uh, subcommittee report, basically said we weren't going to initiate any changes to our bear hunts. Uh, what we've left in the guidelines right now is what's in the bear plan. and. Uh, we're not recommending any changes to that. Uh, we feel like that's a uh, biologically defensible place to be. Um, but we know there's, there's public sentiment on that, and so we want uh, the commission to tell us where uh, they would like to see that wind up. As with uh, elk and deer and pronghorn, we also don't specify our ewe hunt objectives well, and so we want to do a better job there. With mule deer and elk, there's a lot of units, not a lot of units, there's a few units where we've got uh, units that we manage more conservatively. And so what we want to do is identify those, 
um, call them alternative management units and what we manage for there is the harvest of older age class animals and so we've tried to identify those in the guidelines um, also in response to that public comment about standardizing season dates we've tried to do that to the extent possible however um, we recognize we're not going to have one set of elk dates or one set of uh, mule deer dates and so the current draft you'll see has got a lot of different uh, edits and changes there um, that include a lot of non-standard dates <clears throat> mountain lion uh, for this species we're proposing uh, going to a statewide objective we've had a variety of different objectives through the course of time uh, we never achieved any of them objective is what it's called in NAC <clears throat> but it's not uh, specifically a target that we're trying to reach um, what we want to do that's kind of a limit um, <clears throat> what we want to do is monitor genetic population structures that have already been identified in research conducted in Nevada we want to monitor the harvest characteristics just like we do we're proposing with bull elk we'd look at the harvest characteristics of uh, um, of the uh, harvest of, of, of mountain lions um, research has indicated that when you start to see a growing proportion of adult females that's females that are three years old and older starting to increase in the harvest um, a larger and larger proportion that indicates that you're driving that population down this is the approach uh, that both Arizona and Colorado currently use um, and so what we want, would do is if we start to see a population uh, getting um, the harvest starting to exceed our, our objective then we would put a uh, harvest objective on that particular subpopulation not on the state um, and it would be part of the state um, mountain goats we're not proposing any change at this point in time um, upland game and fur bears no substantive changes uh, we have clarified our management objectives for bobcats and we've also added something for gray fox uh, largely <clears throat> the bobcat information uh, we have the season length uh, regulated by uh, the harvest characteristics once again in this case the uh, proportion of, of young in the harvest and the proportion of male to female uh, that would uh, in the the other clarifications that we the gray fox season would mirror uh, the bobcat season <coughs> So we, uh, we held five public meetings around the state. Um, we had about 80 participants at these various meetings. <clears throat> and uh, um, we told everybody that what we'd be doing is, is sharing that uh, with you here. Uh, you guys have copies. And we also posted this on the uh, support material just recently as well. Um, ultimately, we plan to provide a final recommendation to the commission in November and following that adoption we would use that for the next uh, intend to use it for the next four years uh, to guide our implementation so um, following the August workshop uh, we transmitted the, uh, the the memo to the cab um, on August 19th uh, we shared with them the press release the public meeting schedule and the current draft guidelines um, like I said we had about 80 attendees we had uh, a number of cab representatives that were able to attend um, we met earlier this week to review the input that we've received and considered re uh, revisions to that uh, we've updated that version those revisions are in track changes uh, we still have a few errors that uh, that we've got in the document uh, for instance um, uh, we've left out a couple of places where muzzleloader seasons should have showed up uh, we got an, we added a hunt that was not there before and we didn't intend to and we've uh, treated elk somewhat inconsistently on a couple of units and uh, need to, to do a little bit better and those are just the tip of the iceberg we have several other places that uh, um, we've also got minor glitches in there and we need to correct when uh, when I talk about simplifying season structures this is something that uh, Mike Cox put together last night um, and uh, just kind of identifying what our season overlap currently looks like and this is for Elko County um, 
if we adopted everything that we've got in the guidelines right now. There's still overlap there. There's still uh, some hunts that will be on top of one another. But I think a lot of the seasons are a lot more standardized and, and you reduce that overlap. Going over a little bit further into White Pine, uh, Lincoln counties, um, it, it's still, you know, we've, we've kind of improved things a bit again. Um, the thing that I really took away from this is if you count the numbers down the left side of the screen, uh, there's 42 different hunts that are lined up on that. And so it's extremely difficult to try and separate all the hunts and try and keep people out there um, in the hunt that they want to be in without being uh, overlapping another hunt. <clears throat> so provided you with uh, um, copies, uh, just some of the highlights. We had uh, certainly had some uh, uh, a variety of different input uh, in Vegas and Reno. We had a lot of uh, people that showed up to express uh, opposition to the bear hunt. And this is this was my reminder to to come back to the component to the point that people that show up at meetings um, generally do not represent the proportion of people. In, in, in the public on, that feel a particular way. I'm not suggesting that most people don't oppose the bear hunt. I'm saying that our, the proportions um, differ. And so you have to be careful on the, the uh, um, inferences you draw from the number of people that show up. Um, written, got, written comments, we also had uh, um, two letters from the Humane Society of the United States. Um, and uh, we even had, uh, you know, some comment on exactly what we should call the guidelines. Um, we're, we're calling it uh, the harvest guidelines uh, because we, seem, we believe that that's the most consistent and representative uh, recommendation that we can make. Uh, we had one hunter, and I included his letter in this, this document. Uh, he wrote to us specifically after his antelope hunt this year. And he said, man, there were bucks everywhere. Why in the heck don't you guys issue more tags? And so, you know, you get the, the range of perspectives, um, not necessarily the proportion, but we shared all of the letters that we received, all of the written comment we received, um, and that is also posted on the <coughs> website as of today as well. Um, next steps, um, <coughs> you know, we were hoping for some discussion today on the current draft and uh, direction from the commission. My guess is that, uh, you know, based on some of the discussion we've already had, um, we've tried to incorporate uh, 